And our next speaker is Kim Tallbear. Dr. Tallbear is an associate professor in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta and the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience, and Environment. She is the author of Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging, and The False Promise of Genetic Science. And she's currently working on a book that interrogates settler colonial commitments to settlement in place, disciplines, monogamy, and marriage. Please welcome Kim Tallbear. Do I get 25 minutes? Is that right, or 20? 20. 20. 20. Or, <laughs> I normally talk about this stuff in an hour, so let's see what I can do. Um, but I'll just stop whenever is a, is a good place. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. So I didn't actually set out to study the politics of individual claims to indigenous ancestry and identity that I'll touch on today. I, I have been pulled into analyzing these cases because I wrote this book on Native American DNA, uh, which was published in 2013 by University of Minnesota Press. And that book, despite its title, is not actually about Native Americans, the term we use in the United States, which is where I'm from. It's actually about the scientists, largely straight white men, because of historical inequities in the way that who gets access to higher education, what they actually think about Native American DNA. So I am an anthropologist of white people, particularly scientists. And that was also a performative move on my part because Indigenous people are always on the end of the scientific gaze under the microscope of settlers. And I thought, well, one of the ways to push back against that is I'm gonna study all of you. And actually, I think white people, I think white people are far more interesting anthropological subjects than us. We're just regular old people. So, so that's what that book is largely about. There's a chapter on genetic genealogists in there too, uh, which were largely privileged white people. Uh, the, the group that I hung out with, not all genetic genealogists are. Uh, but the group that I ended up hanging out with online, this is back 2005, 2006, when listservs were still a thing, and that's where they were doing a lot of their technical conversations around the genetic ancestry testing. Um, Susan, your talk was really interesting to me because I'm sitting here thinking, I've been studying this since 2001. Why is this still a story? Like, we had all of these insights 15, 20 years ago, right? Why are people still taking these tests? Well, you answered my question. I think because these other kinds of industries have risen up who are um, selling their products in concert with, with these genetic ancestry tests. So I've been sitting here thinking, I just don't even get why people are still talking about this. I did my first interview with the New York Times in 2005. I started doing the research unbeknownst to me for this book in 2001. We're sitting here in 2019. I'm still answering the same questions from reporters all these years later, like the public conversation around these tests really has not changed. So the other thing I'm gonna do uh, really quickly in this talk is I'm gonna touch on the um, identity claims of two other high profile cases. So Elizabeth Warren is one because she's now running for president. Uh, back in 2012, I started talking about Elizabeth Warren because that's when she first, uh, when her Cherokee ancestry claims first came to light, when her Republican Senate candidate opponent in Massachusetts, Scott Brown, First called her Pocahontas. This is this does not originate with Trump. This re originates with another Republican, Scott Brown, in Massachusetts. I and a bunch of Cherokee people, because I'm the DNA person, and then a Cherokee genealogist got interviewed in 2012 about her claims. Cherokee genealogists have done her ancestry on all of her lines. The Cherokee are one of the most well-documented people in the world. So this story, all of these predominantly white Southerners have that they're Cherokee. That's just not accurate. Cherokee genealogists know because they have all of these roles based on settler land allotment and all that, the Cherokee were basically tracked down, relocated, and forced to go on to roles. So we've all been debating her claims since 2012. They kind of die down a little bit once she gets elected and then Trump brings them up again and then they become an issue again in 2018 because she decides to run for president. But the other two cases I'm gonna talk about are Andrea Smith, who is a University of California Riverside professor who was outed in 2015 for her false Cherokee claims. Um, and then another person who's probably more well known to many of you in this room, the darling of the Canadian literary scene, Joseph Boyden, and his uh, various shifting indigenous claims, of, you know, claiming anything from Métis to Nipmunk and everything in between. So if this works, it doesn't always. <laughs> this is Maury Povich, and I know this is like you don't normally take your data from Maury Povich, but I run into these people in real life too, so that's why I trust this. So Mary is getting her DNA test back. Maury Povich did a whole bunch of this, and her mother said she was half Cherokee, her grandfather was full blood. Here she's finding out she's not. 
I do see emotional. So I gave this talk, a form of this talk originally in front of the American Anthropological Association. I had three or four uh, black American scholars who were like the big names on, Aunt, like Alondra Nelson was one of them, I think. They cracked up at this. Because I'm like, she's crying, she's not indigenous American. They said, oh, she's crying, she's got 15% African ancestry. <laughs> so we all had a good laugh for various reasons, but Mary's really, really broken up about this and glad that her mom is not alive to know that she was not really half Native American, quote unquote, because she was so proud of it and she stood by it. And of course, her claims were to being Cherokee, which the vast majority of claims, uh, false claims in the United States to indigenous ancestry are Cherokee. Uh, much like the vast majority of false claims to indigenous ancestry in Canada are Métis. There are a lot, of, uh, a lot of similarities in the history and politics and the narratives of the kinds of claims that non-indigenous people are making to having indigenous ancestry and therefore making claims. Uh, in the case of Canada, it's even worse because the quote unquote Eastern Métis are making actual claims to hunting rights, tax breaks. They're making real material claims based on ancestry. This has not really happened in the United States in quite a direct way. It's a more insidious route to making claims to land, territory, and identity. So sorry that didn't work, but you can Google Mary's DNA truth if you want to see it in all of its glory on the internet. So I'll just recap these three cases. And when am I supposed to be finished? I want to, like, a quarter past or 10 past? Uh, yeah, 10 past. 10 past, right. okay. So we don't, let's see. So it's July 2015, and Andrea Smith is on the left. It's this made uh, uh, Inside Higher Ed. I think it made the Chronicle of Higher Education, plus, you know, BuzzFeed and a lot of the more mainstream news. Um, Andrea Smith uh, was a very, and is a very well-respected uh, scholar, um, was known as an indigenous feminist at the time and somebody who works on violence against indigenous women. So a lot of her scholarship is really important scholarship. But she had been uh, repeatedly confronted by the Cherokee Nation since the 90s, the early 90s, about these kinds of claims, because again, they're very well-documented people. And you want to be careful if you're going to claim you're Cherokee. They're not like other tribes in the US. They actually have a lot of genealogists on staff, and they will go after you. They have. Um, I think they're the I think they're larger than Navajo Nation. I think Cherokee have about 225,000 citizens. Navajo Nation is the next largest with a 175. Uh, but uh, so this happens in 2015. Uh, many of us in, well, not many of us, but some of us in, inside the indigenous studies world knew about this controversy for a long time. It finally comes to light in 2015. I first found out in 2011, I went to graduate school with Andrea Smith. And so I knew her as a friendly, I'd say a friendly colleague, not a close friend. Um, 15 indigenous feminists decided to write a letter to Indian Country Today, which is like the national native newspaper in the United States, and this was a very hard decision to make, but we came around to the idea that this wasn't simply a violation of the Cherokee Nation sovereignty that she was doing this, which is originally what many of us thought. We came around to the idea that this is a pervasive problem in academia, that we have a lot of people claiming to be indigenous and taking advantage of scholarships and jobs and things like that. Um, and based on these kinds of claims. And we thought if we're all working, because the point of indigenous studies, or before that it was called native studies, the point of that when it arose in the 70s and late 60s was to support indigenous governance and indigenous sovereignty. And how can we do that if we are tacitly allowing and approving these kinds of claims, which have real material consequences? And that's a much longer story which I could get into if, if I had the time. The second case then, of course, is Elizabeth Warren, 2012. I talked about it again in 2018. Uh, she takes a DNA test. Andrea Smith never did, good for her. Uh, Native people, including myself and a lot of other policy people and Native writers and reporters advised Elizabeth Warren not to take the DNA test, but she took it anyway. We were very disappointed that she did that, did not help her case, as we all know. Um, and then Joseph Boyden, uh, I think this is 2016. Um, Boyden is outed by uh, APTN, so Aboriginal People Television, Television Network's uh, Jorge Barrera broke this story about Joseph Boyden and his, quote, shape-shifting indigenous identity. Uh, Barrera wrote uh, in APTN that over the years, Boyden has variously claimed his family's roots extended to the Métis, Mi'kmaq, Ojibwe, and Nipmonk peoples. He traces his Ojibwe roots in part to his uncle Earl Boyden, who in the mid 20th century went by the alias Indian Injun Joe, uh, and who dressed in a headdress and sold faux Indian crafts to tourists in Algonquin Park, Ontario. Uh, the APTN article cites documentation of Earl Boyd, Boyden admitting that he had no quote unquote Indian blood. So this was a big controversy in the Canadian press that many of you 
probably took note of. Um, so a few indigenous commentators have also taken the position that I originally took with, the, with Andrea Smith, that only those from indigenous communities that Boyden claims should weigh in on this issue. Uh, but I no longer find that argument compelling. Boyden's playing Indian and that of the other two uh, examples has a far reaching effect beyond the indigenous peoples that they claim. Uh, so far, no indigenous community has come forth to claim Boyden as a, uh, to claim him as a descendant. And this is crucial if we are to defend our collective political identities because those are their collective identities, their citizenship identities. These are not simply individual claims to ancestry. Again, there's a lot to talk about there. Um, there is one prominent indigenous filmmaker that declared publicly that she would ceremonially adopt Boyden. And this is something that, that we do in indigenous communities. We make kinship in a variety of ways. We have sex, so we have babies, number one, like many of us. We also uh, make kin through ceremonial adoption. This is quite common, and you'll see stories about this. But I can ceremonially adopt, for example, a close friend as a brother or sister, it does not make them a citizen of the Sistan Wapten Oyate, which is where I'm a citizen. So we have kin who are not a member of our race, our family, our, our nation, right? We make kin in, in, in different ways. We also do in the United States, I'm not sure about up in Canada, we do a lot of legal adoption among indigenous people because of the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was lobbied for extensively by indigenous people to undo some of the harm of our children being stolen and forcibly out adopted to non-indigenous families. So, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, this whole concept of playing Indian that um, underlies some of my critique. This is a historian, Phil Deloria. Phil Deloria is also Dakota, so I'm Dakota. That's what Sistan Wapden Oyate is. Uh, we, our homelands, our historic homelands are about where the down, downtown St. Paul, Minnesota is now. Um, Phil uh, is now at Harvard. Um, first tenured native professor ever at Harvard. They're a little bit behind University of Alberta, I have to say. <laughs> so we've got like 28 faculty, I think. Um, but he wrote this really influential book published in 1998 on Yale University Press where he, uh, I'll just give you some quotes because this is really, this is what I see going on still today, um, both in terms of these ancestry claims and in terms of the mascot issue. These things are related. And I've often had people say, we have more important things to worry about, right? Like missing and murdered indigenous women, our territorial claims, our hunting rights. All of these issues are related because all of those issues, whether it's murdering us, kidnapping our children, mascotting us, or claiming to be us when you are not us, all of these are designed to eliminate us from the land physically or conceptually or culturally. It's all about our disappearance because without our disappearance, settlers cannot have a moral claim to the land. So this is why all of these things matter. So I really reject that kind of attention policing that happens. You have more important things to worry about. Don't worry about this. So Phil Deloria in his monograph, Playing Indian, notes that indigenous people must be ever vanishing as a race, and there's a lot of data for this in the historical record, ceding the moral authority to the United States of America to inhabit and govern this land. One tactic that they use to justify their appropriation of land and no doubt deal with their cognitive dissonance in the more immoral project of the settler state is the appropriation of indigenous imagery and identities, that is, a whole lot of people play Indian. Deloria draws on a rich archive of historical data, and in addition to British writer D.H. Lawrence's analysis of an essentially unfinished and incomplete U.S. American consciousness that produced an unparalleled national identity crisis. He's writing this back at the beginning of the 20th century, D.H. Lawrence, and Deloria's drawing on him. Lawrence saw the Indian as, quote, at the heart of American ambivalence. Savage Indians served Americans as oppositional figures against whom one might imagine a civilized national self. Coded as freedom, however, wild Indianness proved equally attractive, setting up a dialectic of simultaneous desire and repulsion. So we're both desired and we're repulsive. Lawrence wrote that no place exerts its full influence upon a newcomer until the old inhabitant is dead or absorbed. Therefore, the unexpressed spirit of America could not be fulfilled without Indians either being exterminated or assimilated into white America. So Deloria summarizes, the indeterminacy of American identity stems in part from the nation's inability to deal with Indian people. Americans wanted to feel natural affinity with the continent and it was Indians who could teach them such aboriginal closeness. Yet in order to control the landscape, they had to destroy the original inhabitants. Half-articulated Indianness continually lurks behind various efforts 
at American self-imagination. And then Deloria goes on in this book to document a range of playing Indian practices that have been occurring in the United States since before the Revolutionary War from 18th century images representing the Indian as the oppressed American colonist uh, in their red face at the Boston Tea Party to 19th century fraternal orders to the 20th century with its Boy Scouts, hobbyist powwows, and the New Age movement. So we have four centuries of settler identity crisis focused on playing Indian. That's what basically what that comes down to. And then what you have is you have the DNA test now coming into that. I'm not gonna have time to talk about this, but this is important for understanding how histories of race play into the uh, different way in which native people are racialized in relationship to white supremacy and the different way in which black people are racialized. We do different things and our racial identities are constructed differently in order to support uh, the white supremacist state. Um, I think I'm, I have about two minutes. So I'm trying to think how I can wrap up by saying something about the DNA testing. So the the playing Indian phenomena is four centuries old, right, as Deloria points out. And so beginning in about, um, I think the first companies that I looked at that were doing Native American DNA tests were around 2002. I think many of those companies have passed out of existence. And so at the time 23andMe emerged, I was not anymore looking uh, at these companies, but I followed them around a bit in the early 2000s. And so what you had were, um, primarily the people buying genetic ancestry tests are people who don't have any lived connection to native communities. So they're racially identified in the United States is usually either white or black. And I can talk more about that. Uh, a lot of that is about the, it, particularly in the east of the United States and the south, where you had massive Indian removal in the 19th century, where people are living and growing up without indigenous communities in their midst, they are the ones more likely to take the tests and make those claims. Where I grew up in rural South Dakota in a reservation border town, this is a red-white racial divide. There's whites and there's natives. And there are no white people who wanna pretend they're an Indian on a reservation border town, so they're not the ones taking the test. So you have these different forms of racism that happen, right? The explicit, in-your-face, violent racism of a reservation border town, and these more implicit forms of racism that are erasure, that seem more multicultural, that seem liberal, but they're, again, they're all related. Um, so that's who's taking the genetic ancestry test that you will see on, on Ancestry.com. And I'll just say one more thing before I wrap up. Uh, tribes in the United States, many First Nations in Canada do use DNA testing now, but it's not this kind. It's DNA parentage tests, so what's called the DNA profile. And those are not tests that look at your ancestry 10, 20, 100 generations ago, those are tests that, that tell you who your parents might be, who your siblings might be, and those are used because of these, um, what did you, misattributed paternity is what I call it, right? So often when, you're, when you have a question in somebody's genealogy, uh, and we do genealogies in order to enroll or confer citizenship within tribal, tribal nations, it's often paternity that's in question, right? And so that's when a DNA profile test will be used. But one of the things that we do in my tribe and a lot of other tribes in the United States, I'm not sure about Canada, because all this stuff is kind of hush-hush when you're talking about enrollment stuff. We will also accept uh, an affidavit from three members of the, the, biological, the alleged biological father's family uh, claiming that offspring as one of their kin or we can do a DNA test. So we do have ways of using DNA on a case-by-case -case basis if we need it, but we're also looking for ways in many cases to um, consider these more social kinds of forms of kinship. And so my, my final word on this is, I think this is much in line with what Susan was saying, our forms of kinship, across these kind of cultural and racial lines are very much biosocial. So you have to look at the entanglements of our knowledge of biology and our actual social practices. And so I'm somebody who, while I've been really critical for a decade and a half of the privileging of genetic ancestry and reckoning Native American identity and kinship, I also recognize that biology is a piece of the puzzle, but we need to be really mindful about how we are foregrounding that biological knowledge and also be respectful and consider, and consider our long Understanding social methods of doing kinship and family as well. So I'm sure there's a lot to talk about in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mentioned um, when I was starting that earlier this morning that um, that you were featured in a in a program we did on this a couple of years ago on, yeah. on the 180, and the title was "Sorry." that DNA test doesn't make you indigenous. And I just, I, I wanna quote 
you back to you right now, because I'd like to explore the, something that you said during that story. You said it's, it's not just a matter of what you claim, it's a matter of who claims you. And I wonder if you could sort of dig into that a little bit, in a little bit more depth to, to explain, it, within the context of these 23andMe mm -hmm. and Ancestry's CA DNA tests, what exactly you mean. Well, I think what a lot of indigenous scholars, and I actually took that quote from Chris Anderson, who's a, who wrote the book Métis, and he's uh, our dean at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. He's Métis, he's from, I think, Prince Albert, is that in Saskatchewan? Mm -hmm. I'm still learning my geography up here. Um, so, but it's a quote I take from Chris, and I think it's something that's kind of permeated throughout the literature in the last couple years. Um, it, it is about family, but it's also, he's really alluding to the idea of being a citizen of a nation or a member of a nation, right? And so this is the thing that gets lost on a lot of people that don't have close proximity to indigenous communities and the way that we do belonging and the way that we do citizenship. A lot of non-indigenous people are thinking about us as a racial category, right? As, and often as an ancestral category that they can claim as individuals because they have the money to buy a DNA test or the time to do a genealogy. And they're not really thinking about that, that indigenous collective, that tribe or that First Nation or that, or that, indigen or that Métis community exercising the power to claim or not claim them. So it really is taking agency away from indigenous collectivities and claiming that agency for oneself as an individual. And I know people think that they are simply doing nothing more than often recreational genealogy or looking to find out who they really are and exercising this kind of individual human right to find out knowledge about themselves. But that's pushing up against our rights as collectivities to determine who our, who our, citizen, who our citizens are. Now I'll say about Elizabeth Warren, she later clarified when she really began claiming this ancestry, it was obvious in her, in her discussions of that she didn't have a clue about how Cherokee citizenship worked. Um, and then later on, after she's challenged by successive uh, native writers and policy people, she begins to back away from that just in the last year and say, okay, I never claimed to be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. What I claimed was ancestry, but what happens is you can't separate those two things because in the larger American and probably Canadian imagination, ancestry is synonymous with being indigenous or being a member of a particular tribe or first nation. For us, it's not. Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is privileging their definitions, which are partly overlapping, but not synonymous with our definitions. And we really want to privilege our definitions. But this is what happens in a settler state, right? Settlers get to determine the parameters of racial definitions and categories. We didn't have a lot of say in that. And so we're still in that moment where indigenous people are not having their definitions um, of our kinship and citizenship and national identities respected and instead these other kinds of definitions are being imposed upon us and so that's that's kind of what that's getting at right if we're not claiming you it's not simply your right to claim to be us and there's yet another point here and correct me if I'm wrong but uh, these DNA tests they don't say Dakota or no. Inuit they say Native American and, yeah. and it's, they shouldn't give tribes. No. They shouldn't give tribes. They, that's, there is no scientific basis for that. When, so you if know, you want to take that, you know, the Native American version of the Irish holiday, yeah. and you find out you're 28% Native American on your 23 and me. So with Elizabeth Warren's test. genetic ancestry test, there's been a lot of conversation around this because uh, Carlos Bustamante, who's the Stanford genome scientist who was advising her, and he was an advisor to 23 and me, Carlos mostly works in Latin America, and so his data sets are mostly from there. Native people in, in the United States have shown themselves to not want to be sampled, so there's a dearth of Native American samples in these data sets. So he's working in Latin America. Now, of course, we're all genetically related, right? And so you can have a scientific debate about how applicable those markers are to helping her claim uh, Cherokee ancestry. but. Because we share these markers and higher and lower frequencies, as Susan indicated, throughout the Americas, what we're calling Native American markers, they don't, they don't point to a particular tribe. I mean, you could go in, if you wanted to go into the Cherokee Nation now uh, and sample, first of all, scientists would have to go in and do a decent sized sample of all of those who claim to be less admixed. Well, most Cherokee are highly admixed they're going to show ancestry from all over the world, right? So it's really going to be hard to get a representative sample, number one. And then we know in 
in tribes or indigenous communities across the continent, we have many, many lineages. I mean, I have a Turtle Mountain Chippewa great-grandmother. I have Cree and Métis ancestry. I have Dakota ancestry. I have Cheyenne and Arapaho ancestry. Which of those tribes are you going to privilege if you do a DNA test on me and you find my Native American markers? Who do those belong to? So that, and that's how it is for all of us. So they should not be attributing them to a particular tribe. That's, that's simply not um, science. That's, you can't determine that. Through, through these kinds of, I think what happens is the, the geneticists who are going out and sampling indigenous populations are not understanding how much we mixed and moved around, and I always use mixed with scare quotes, both pre and post contact. We have not stayed in one place. We have, we have uh, mated with different kinds of po different populations around the, the continent. So how do you decide at one, which pinpoint in biogeographical time, you're going to say this marker belongs to that tribe. And then tribes come in and out of existence, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Tim Talbot. Yeah. And our final speaker this morning is uh, Jackie Stacy, who flew into Calgary from Manchester on Saturday in that horizontal blizzard. <clears throat> And stayed, didn't just didn't just go straight to the departure lounge and and back home. Uh, Dr. Stacy is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of Manchester and the author of the Cinematic Life of the Gene. She's also the co-editor of the journals Screen and Feminist Theory. Her research covers subjects as diverse as the transnational modes of spectatorship in Hollywood cinema queer film and video, the visualizing technologies of medical science, and the new genetic constructions of sexualized and racialized bodies in popular culture. Please welcome Jackie Stacy. Thank you. Um, thanks so much to Jim for this invitation and to Sean and the others organizing this event. I'm very pleased to have survived the flight and to be with you here today. Um, I'm going to speak to you about some ideas from my book, The Cinematic Life of the Gene, which looks at a selection of films about cloning and genetic engineering um, between 1995 and 2010. I'll call these DNA films just as a shorthand. In the next 20 minutes, I shall try and make the case that the cinema has something very particular to offer our discussions about the cultural politics of DNA. So my question for the session is what what does the cinema tell us about how and why the prospect of cloning and genetic engineering disturbs our most profound ideas about gender, sexuality, reproduction, racialized differences, and the body? These cultural disturbances, I think, generate three key anxieties um, which we find in film. The first is, how do I know that the person is who they appear to be? How do I know that this person is who they appear to be? It seems to me that DNA cultures make a, a promise to make our bodies more legible, but they also introduce new fears and anxieties about deception. And we've already heard uh, some of the debates around that. So that first question. Um, secondly, who am I if I can be cloned? Cloning obviously troubles our sense of individuality and authenticity. And thirdly, what now guarantees the me, not me distinction if biology no longer does? So the foundation of biological difference itself now feels as if it's been shaken by the prospect of cloning and genetic engineering. Before I move in to talk about um, a couple of the films in a little bit of detail, I want to start with two propositions. The first thing I want to suggest is that there's something deeply visceral about the disturbances presented by cloning and other forms of genetic engineering, precisely because they promise, or threaten, or both, to reorganize and disorganize the very foundations of life itself of how life gets reproduced, and of our relationship to ourselves and to each other. And I don't think we can understand our responses to this prospect, the prospect of cloning and genetic engineering, purely at the rational level. 
Rather, I want to argue that there's something about the emergence of DNA cultures which pulls on our unconscious fears and desires. We may like to think of ourselves as highly rational beings with a continuous sense of self and with intentions which are fully conscious. But I think we're more at odds with ourselves than that. I think we're more fractured, more unknown, more unknowable to ourselves and to each other. I see in myself and in those around me patterns and repetitions of behavior that seem somewhat beyond our control, that are not always even in our own interests. Why does this matter in approaching the cultural politics of DNA? Well, I want to emphasize that for me, culture is not merely a collection of images and stories. And it is certainly not a mirror on the world or a reflection of a reality that's been formed somewhere else. Rather, culture for me is a place of complex associations and indirect meanings that generate unconscious as well as conscious responses. There's something I think really powerfully affective about our responses to the prospect of cloning and genetic engineering. And by affective, I mean that sense of being seized by a strong bodily pull of something not yet quite nameable as a feeling. In other words, we have a visceral response to DNA cultures because they threaten to scramble our lines of descent, to remove reproduction from its heterosexual foundation, and to interfere with traditional structures of gender, parenting, and kinship. Of course, some of us may welcome some of these new horizons. DNA cultures coincide with the possibilities of lesbian and gay marriage, adoption, and parenthood. The pluralization of family forms, what we might call improvised kinship, responding um, to Susan's paper, and also introduce new gender categories and um, coincide with the emergence of trans and non-binary identifications. My second proposition is that the cinema and cloning have something of a special relationship. I'll be bold and say that the cinema occupies pride of place in DNA cultures. Why? Well, because there's something that film can do that is very particular to the medium itself. I know that we don't always all sit in a dark cinema together anymore watching films. Lots of uh, my students watch films on their phones. Um, so this may be less true than it used to be. But generally, I think the cinema is called a dream machine for a reason. Film scholars have argued that when we enter the cinema, we're entering something and, and watch films in the cinema, we're entering something of a dreamlike state, which is not true of looking at photographs, art, or watching television. Moving images, it has been argued, take us into another form of consciousness and perhaps reach into our unconscious. And therefore, they have the capacity to generate very deep-rooted associations, very deep-rooted fears and anxieties. Films thus draw, and for, draw upon and form our deepest fears and desires. That's, that's my starting point. So how does this make cinema and cloning close bedfellows? Well, because cinema and cloning both present us with imitations of life. Cinema is a cultural technology of imitation, insofar as we believe in the fictional world that it presents us with. Cloning is a biological technology of imitation, insofar as its copies are indistinguishable from its originals. So each, cloning and the cinema, operates at the level of fantasy, and they both fascinate and disturb us in deeply visceral ways. Faced with the prospect of technologies that might rob us of our individuality and our authenticity, and begin, sorry, faced with that prospect, we begin to imagine monsters and we begin to uh, elaborate narratives which are about the fear of deception and new mixtures. New mixtures being a very common theme in these DNA films. So DNA films explore these anxieties through stories of doppelgangers, twins, aliens, forbidden intimacies, and transgressive sexualities. These films use familiar motifs, visual deception, disguise, and impersonation. Science fiction, the thriller, body horror, and the romantic comedy all construct genetic engineering as a potential threat 
through narratives of disguise and mistaken identity. People are not who they say they are. It's a fundamental anxiety rehearsed in DNA films. Someone presents as in Gattiger um, and is trying to impersonate someone else by modifying his body um, through genetic and other techniques. You cannot trust what you see. Here we have uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Adam um, looking at himself, having um, met his own clone, looking at himself in the mirror. Who am I now? Body surfaces hide deeper genetic truths, another commonly uh, rehearsed narrative in film. Here we have Syl, um, the mutating clone, who transforms from this hyper-white feminine ideal, you can see on your left, um, to a sort of murderous monster in species. So these are some of the very commonly uh, rehearsed anxieties. Another is the uncoupling of heterosexuality from reproduction. It's explored in many uh, DNA films. So um, it's perceived to be threatening to undo gender in some way. For example, in the film Multiplicities, the husband um, who is cloned in order to help with the housework, he can't, he can't manage it on his own. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I promised myself I wouldn't laugh at that line. <laughs> um, the more times he's cloned, the camper he becomes. So the further away from the original, the more his masculinity is diminished, if you like. Represented in the gesture, in the image on your right. DNA films are also full of homoerotic pairings and triangulations, and about narratives, about passing. Who can tell? Can you tell? How can you tell? What's the code? Um, in Alien Resurrection, the homoerotic uh, relationship between Ripley and Core. In Gattaca, there's a, a triangulation between the desire um, between the three major characters. The Sixth Day, um, even, even Arnie has to uh, have his uh, homoerotic moment with his clone. Uh, and in Technolust, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment, there's, uh, there's a kind of uh, homoerotic uh, coupling of sisters, siblings, not sure what to call them. I want to say something about the convergence of the biological and the cultural, which is visualized so perfectly in this production still for the art house pastiche film Technolust. It's directed by Lynn Hirschman Leeson, the independent filmmaker and artist. And um, it stars uh, Tilda Swinton in all four roles. Uh, the three red clones, Ruby the red clone, um, Olive the green clone, and uh, Maureen the blue clone, and uh, also the scientist, Rosetta Stone, seen here on the right, um, who downloaded her DNA to make these clones. The film is a pastiche. Pastiche is defined by Richard Dyer as an imitation that seeks to be appreciated as an imitation. So you can imagine immediately why pastiche lends itself so readily to um, be the form of a film about cloning. So here's Ruby the Red Clone. All four are played by Tilda Swinton, Marine, and Olive. And here's Tilda Swinton playing all four. Tilda Swinton, the mistress of disguise, I call her. So this image, I think, sums up something really important about the relationship between the biological and the cultural, which is partly what we've been hearing about already this morning. Transforming the red, green, blue components of the video signal into a barcode, the image references the convergence of digital and genetic sampling and the commodification of bodies used throughout the film. So it connects the biological uh, very directly to the cultural. To pause on a uh, Technolust for a moment. Um, as I said, Ruby is one of three color-coded electronic clones, and Rosetta Stone is the scientist who downloaded her DNA to create them. Ruby is a femme fatale. Let me just bring her up again. Ruby is a femme fatale, 
and as such, of course, is not fully legible to the men she's trying to seduce. It's her job to retrieve semen, yes, semen, for the three clones to top up their constantly depleting Y chromosomes. It's a pastiche, remember. You're allowed to laugh. <laughs> so that's her job. Her job is semen retrieval. She goes out and she seduces men uh, in order to retrieve semen that is then made into tea infusions and uh, also injected by the three clones. As a digital clone, downloaded um, by, um, Rosetta St from Rosetta Stone's DNA, Ruby has no sexual desires of her own. So she absorbs, she absorbs line from a, her own Hollywood dream machine, which screens old Hollywood films across her body while she sleeps. She then goes out and reproduces these one-liners to seduce men. They have no context whatsoever, um, but the men follow her nevertheless. Um, she's Tilda Swinton, and they could be, she could be saying anything to them, and they'd follow her. <laughs> her homoerotic intimacy, which I think is fairly clear in this uh, kind of film still, uh, with these pixelated Hollywood heroines, echo, echoes a kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, cuddling lesbian sisters scene in the next room of Olive and Marine. Techno Lust, I think, I pause on this film because it brings questions of fantasy in thinking about DNA culture, uh, culture's center stage. So I think if we're going to be analyzing DNA cultures, we have to think about fantasy. <laughs> this, is a, this is an area rich in fantasy, drenched in fantasy, we might say. I want to introduce the term the genetic imaginary to describe this fantasy landscape. I want to suggest that this genetic imaginary is a fantasy landscape inhabited by artificial bodies which interfere with conventional narratives of gender, reproduction, race, and heterosexual kinship. In the genetic imaginary, post-human life forms are invented whose histories can be rewritten as we've been hearing, and whose futures, the fantasy is, can be extended. These engineered life forms destabilize the traditional signs of biological difference. But whilst these life forms are made by science, and we admire science for making them, perhaps, they also threaten to reveal the limits of science in terms of techniques of controlling them. And as we've been hearing, they promise a transparency, they promise an empirical truth and reality, and yet actually that's, that's not what gets delivered. And often what happens is the techniques that are uh, developed um, are also a source of anxiety because instead of delivering a truth, they actually deliver more ways, um, more forms of deception. It's like our passwords. The more complicated our password system gets, the more options there are for people to hack our accounts, right? It's a similar thing. So the genetic imaginary, I think, is founded on the desire to give the gene a visual form. The gene is not a thing that we can actually see, but there's a desire circulating in these films to actually give the gene a visual form. What is it that we're seeing? What is it that we want to see? So I want to, uh, in, in the last um, part of the time that I have to speak, I want to just highlight three aspects of the genetic imaginary in DNA films. Three aspects of how the gene is given visual life in the cinema. So how it, it, it's not, we can't visualize it, we want to see it, it's actually invisible in some way, and yet it is given visual form in the cinema, which tells us something about the structures of these fantasies. So first of all, the first aspect of the genetic imaginary in DNA films I want to draw attention to is the visual architectures of the gene, the relationship between inner and outer forms. DNA films, I want to suggest, have a distinctly spatial sense, or they give a distinctly spatial sense to the geneticized body through um, various relationships that they construct between inner and outer forms. External spaces give a sense of the body's newly imagined interiors. In Gattaca and in Code 46, for example, there's an emphasis on symmetry, pattern, sequence, repetition, 
offering an affective sense of the geneticized body on the screen. So outer forms here produce a sense of what we might call a genetic aesthetic. It gives us this feeling that we are seeing something inside the body, which of course we aren't. But it gives us that feeling of a genetic aesthetic. The use also of spectacular architectures and expansive urban locations, such as the Frank Lloyd Wright building in Gattaca, or the aerial shots of the empty freeways of Shanghai in Code 46, they produce a sense of the body's genetic structures through contrasting scales, through contrasting scales. The giganticism of these external structures, or the sense of scale of for example, these shots from the fifth element or the island, is the other side of what Judith Roof has called the legacy of investigation into the minute as the place where we might find answers. And she's trying to sort of characterize uh, the fascination with genetic science and the turn to genetic science to give us social answers to social and political questions. So she, she says, the legacy of investigation into the minute as the place where we might find answers. And what I'm suggesting in these um, films is that the scale is reversed, and we have this sense of uh, the, these gigantic expanses giving us this sense of um, the opposite of that. In the collage animation film, Genetic Admiration by Francis Leeming, the pr these propositions are reversed, and we have a gigantic woman pregnant with the whole of SeaWorld in her belly, who has become the reproductive vessel for the masculine adventure narratives of both science and popular entertainment. Here, she gets up and walks out of the city of Toronto in disgust. So that's the first aspect I wanted to mention. The second, uh, the second aspect of the genetic imaginary and DNA films is this preoccupation with the body as code. The body is code. So to return to Technolust, Swinton is a figure famous for her pale whiteness and her mutability. As, as the cloned triplets in this film, she performs three types of classic feminine white desirability, the brunette, the redhead, and the blonde. The different colors here the different colors of hair, sorry, clothing and decor absurdly mark out the individuality of each. This genetic aesthetic turns biological copying into cultural codes. The visible artifice of difference brings Eastern as well as Western conventional ideals into the frame, the silk kimono combined with Ruby's ritualized precision in serving the semen tea produces a kind of orientalized aesthetic, I think, of service. So the problem of sameness, which is a problem that these films are preoccupied with, sameness difference, how has this been reconfigured? How are we going to know? The problem of sameness becomes a question of racialized as well as genetic typing. Playing out the cliche, how are we going to know the difference? Playing out the cliche of white Westerners not being able to see the difference in non-Western, non-white faces. So here, they're color-coded, so you can tell the difference. That's what it's playing on. The visible differences between the white clones transform biological distinctions into cultural ones, or we might say, genetics into a question of aesthetics. The third and final thing I want to say is uh, the third aspect of the genetic imaginary in DNA films is the threat of indeterminacy and of unde undesirable mixing. In a number of more popular films, biology, uh, sorry, biological and cultural coding is explored through anxieties about indeterminacy and about the threat of what we might call undesirable mixing. Scientific expertise intended for surveillance and control, sorry, scientific expertise intended for surveillance and control to secure the authenticity of identity is turned against the authorities often, producing instead new techniques of impersonation. So exactly what is supposed to guarantee authenticity gets reversed and used in the opposite direction. Here are some examples, the iris scanning in the sixth day, the fingerprint in Gattaca, the body's smell in Alien Resurrection, and the password in Code 46. 
As Patrick Gonda has argued, the mixing of biologies in genetic engineering and cloning films has generated a series of narratives about the fear of racial mixing, about the threat of the potential to be non-white. And I quote, the monster that returns with such a vengeance in these films represents the threat of racialized difference, or more importantly, he argues, the inability to determine racialized difference. End quote. These films require the expulsion or amputation of the unhealthy body or body part to get rid of the threat of racial indeterminacy. That's his argument. In Code 46, ethnicity is given a very tangible sign, uh, gives a very tangible sign to the threat of separating reproduction from heterosexuality. The protagonist here is transformed from, on the left-hand side, a white metrosexual to, uh, on the right-hand side, by the end of the film, uh, a sort of figure, uh, an ethnicized figure in exile. And this gives a visual form to the Oedipal threat of genetic mixing. Revealed as the cloned twin of her lover's mother, <laughs> I'll give you a minute. <laughs> Revealed as the cloned twin of her lover's mother, a spontaneous affair with male protagonist Tim Robbins becomes an abject Oedipal transgression. And this is marked, I think, this is marked by a sort of ethnicization of the protagonist. It is the white body that is so often the site of genetic amplification in these films. But this only reveals the anxiety anxieties about its originality and authenticity and exposes the perceived threat of the potential violent consequences of mixing biologies. Since so many genetic mixing films, if we want to call them that, involve a crossing of the human and non-human divide with dangerous outcomes, Ripley's violence, Sill's strength, Ruby's contagious virus, we can summarize the problem of the white body as the, sorry, we can surmise that the problem of the white body as the sign of the human needs to be endlessly rehearsed. We might uh, pause on Richard Dyer's book, White, to um, think about his argument that the white body is perceived as both too artificial, having lost touch with nature, and not pure enough, always threatened by unnatural biological mixing. In Alien Resurrection, when Ripley, who is part human and part alien clone, in other words, unlike in the other alien films, Ripley in Alien Resurrection is part human, part alien at the level of her DNA, when she enters um, a laboratory and finds um, all the failed clones that were there before her on display, she uh, decides, to torch, decides to torch them all. She destroys them all with fire. But the problem there, unlike in the other alien films where her job is to get rid of the threat, get rid of the alien, the problem here is that Ripley herself has the alien at the level of her DNA. So there is no getting rid of the monster in that final film. Anxieties about individuality and authenticity have a long history. However, the problem of making the difference between the copy and the original visible and legible has taken on a particular force in films since the mid-1990s. Troubling our desire to read identity from surface appearances, looking the same and being the same have now become disturbingly separable. Here's Ripley with the alien that she housed in her body who has now um, who, who has now grown up, and this is her grown up, would we call it sibling, offspring? It's hard to tell. But looking the same and being the same, these two share the same mix of DNAs, has become separable. The genetic imaginary in cinema is a landscape structured by intersecting anxieties and desires, which are integral but not exclusive to DNA cultures. And I want to just end with a slide that sums up what I think these anxieties and desires um, might be um, sort of synthesized as in terms of the films that I looked at. So the genetic imaginary then is structured by the following 
anxieties and desires. First of all, the fear of identity theft and impersonation. Secondly, the threat of an encoded body. If it can be encoded, can it be recoded? Is there imposture um, possible? Thirdly, the aversion to indeterminacy and unnatural mixing. These anxieties, I think, are matched by their counterpart desires. The wish to secure identity as transparent, as we've already heard a lot about this morning. The search for certainty in screening technologies, um, where we will find none. And the drive to make difference stable, predictable, and visible. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Lots to, uh, lots to absorb there. I, I wanted to start by perhaps um, asking you about some of the more old-fashioned elements of, um, of these stories, because it, it occurs to me that, that although they're super new and super cutting edge, they're also sort of eternal. I mean, mm -hmm. you could, you could, some of the things that you said, um, people are, are not who they say they are, things are not what they seem. Mm -hmm. You could look at, at Shakespearean twin mm -hmm. comedies and say some of the same things, and even some of the comments about homoeroticism. You can look at Duke Orsino in Twelfth Night wondering why he's so strangely attracted to that page who's been serving him for the last two days until the page takes the hat off and the hair comes out, and Duke's like, oh, thank God. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot of this is sort of eternal, and you mentioned you mentioned Oedipus as well in, mm -hmm. in the Code 46 story. So what is it that sets these stories apart mm -hmm. from some of those more eternal stories that we're so used to? Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question. Um, I think what I was trying to suggest was that those narratives that we're very famil familiar with about doppelgangers, twins, mistaken identity, these are getting reinscribed um, in a notion of the biological body that is quite transformed by genetics. Now, um, it may be that it's not transformed in the way that science promises. It may be that those are fantasies of um, a more radical transformation than is actually the case. Because uh, as we've heard this morning, biology promises a certainty that actually once you're uh, dealing with its complexity in society, it can't deliver because biology isn't separable from the social or the cultural. But I think what these films are all about is these films are about what would it mean if those um, previous narratives, those, those anxieties about mistaken identity or deception or the femme fatale being able to um, look gorgeous but be rotten to the core, those kinds of tropes, if you like, they are now operating in these films in relation to an idea about biology. Now, it's not an empirical uh, uh, notion of biology um, in a scientific context. It's a cinematic one. And because it can't be shown on the screen, what I'm suggesting is there's all these other ways that our sense of a geneticized body are conveyed. So through scale, through symmetry, through style, through aesthetics. So we have this sense that the body is now something very different, very particular. But of course, it is rehearsing and building on narratives, um, as genres do, that uh, have been cycled and recycled in various ways. But what genre does is it updates itself. If, if we go and see science fiction films, we, don't want to, we do want to see the same story all over again, but we want to see something slightly different. So genetics, um, cloning, genetic engineering, becomes a way of sort of updating the story and drawing people in. So they're not just hearing the same old story. It ha I, I think uh, these stories have a much deeper sense of disturbing us. I think separating reproduction from heterosexuality is a profoundly disturbing thing to a very heteronormative culture, for example. I think some of those things are new because they are presenting as rooted in the biological body. It also seems that on, on a fundamental level, there's a difference between the question being as it is with Oedipus and his mother, or, or Sino and his page, it, there's a difference between the, the question being you, not you, and me, not me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's something fundamentally disturbing to the category of identity itself. And the category of identity itself is a highly contested one, and always, I would argue, uh, a relational one. Who you think you are is always in relation 
to others. But now there's this prospect that there could be the me and then there could also be another version of the me that we might have thought was other but is actually already ourselves. And I think that um, disturbs categories of identity, uh, disturbs the stability of categories of identity being embodied in a way that we can recognize. We desperately want this transparency. I mean, that's what the stories this morning have been demonstrating. We want to be able to know who is and who isn't um, in a number of different ways. But really what these films are rehearsing is what if we lived in a world where actually that wasn't, we weren't legible to each other, we weren't transparent to each other. Now you mentioned artificiality um, in, in terms of, of the whole idea of clones and, and, um, and doppelgangers and that kind of thing. How much artificiality is there in cloning? I mean, mm -hmm. is, it, is it artificial or is it just another version of official? <laughs> um, what, it, what I think it does is I think it roots the artificial in the biological, which we used to think was, well, we, I might use the word authentic. I can now use the word official. Uh, so what it does is it actually... Uh, destroys that distinction. Um, a colleague of mine um, used to do research on Dolly the sheep, and one of her favorite jokes at the beginning of the talk was to put up a slide of a lot of sheeps in the, sheep in the Lake District and say, I'm researching Dolly the sheep, meet Dolly the sheep. And of course, you just looked at all these sheep. You can't see when you see Dolly with all her companions. You have no idea which one is Dolly the sheep, and that was, that was the joke. So I think there... It, the artificial is relocated in the biological, and that's what's disturbing. That was, in some ways, perceived to be, or the fantasy was, that that was somehow something you couldn't interfere with. But now the artificial has been located um, in the official. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm.